So we move on in learning unit eight to chapter 20, and we return again to thinking about the energetics of chemical reactions. So in chapter 20, we're gonna kind of bring together some previous concepts that we've talked about with regards to enthalpy, and we've introduced entropy in chapter 13, but we're really gonna expand on entropy and introduce a new concept of, of um, chemical or chemical reaction energy, which is free energy. And then we'll tie this together all at the end when we think about, again, directionality of chemical reactions, when we tie together all that we've learned about with equilibrium with what we learn about energetics in this chapter. So again, I, I always love doing this chapter because we, we finally pull together kind of all of this information from previous chapters. So in chapter 16, when we were talking about kinetics, we talked about how fast a reaction would proceed. And then we spent three chapters on equilibrium, kind of thinking about how far a reaction will pr proceed towards completion. And now in chapter 20, we're gonna finally answer uh, an important burning question. Will a reaction uh, proceed by either releasing energy or requiring it? And we refer to this as the spontaneity of the process. And I wanna make sure to highlight here that we've learned several ways now that we can think about energy. And so energy is not gonna be specifically defined only as enthalpy as we talked about in chapter 12, or as entropy, as we talked about in chapter 13. But as we'll see as we kind of wrap up this chapter, it's really a culmination of both of those. So when we think about something that's spontaneous, we want to think about something that occurs under um, uh, specific conditions without having to put in additional energy from the outside system. And I know that's kind of an ambiguous sort of phrase, but uh, if we want to think about some things that we've talked about before, spontaneous processes are ones that go downhill. Okay, so again, we're going to bring back sort of our reaction coordinates that we learned about um, in previous chapters and apply them to how we can think about um, spontaneity in uh, chemical reactions. And again, just because something kind of requires a push to get it started, once that process begins, if no further energy is required, we would still call that a spontaneous process. So we'll have lots of applications and examples to think about here. So a little bit of a review here. This was, again, content from Chapter 6, so information from Gen Chem 1. We learned about the first law of thermodynamics that basically said energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's simply going to be converted into alternate forms. <clears throat> and we can have physical changes as well as chemical changes. And kind of this nice example here that we'll build on in this chapter is sort of a burning of a candle that's going to melt some ice. And so we can think about the physical changes that are happening here. And if we think about the physical changes of melting that ice, heat or energy is going to be absorbed here. So that energy uh, in that ice is lower in energy being colder. And so it becomes higher in energy when it's water. So we can think about this from kind of a heat standpoint. And then from a chemical standpoint, we have energy released as both heat and light when we have higher energy reactants that are found in the candle wax and the oxygen that's used for this combustion reaction, generating lower energy products such as carbon dioxide and water. So we kind of dealt with this example uh, before in chapter six to think about um, how we really don't create or destroy energy, we're just kind of converting it into different forms. And so some, uh, again, additional review, things that I want you to remember. When you think of the term enthalpy, Right, we need to think about the letter H, and that's going to remind us that we want to think about heat. Okay, so we talked about exothermic and endothermic reactions dealing with delta H values. So, what I want you to envision from kind of a molecular standpoint is think about bonds that we have and intermolecular forces that we create. So, if something is going to be a favorable process, it's going to release heat, right? And we've talked about that being a negative delta H. And that also means we are going to be making bonds or intermolecular forces. This is a really big important concept to make sure that we understand at its core that if we are going to be breaking bonds or intermolecular forces, that's going to take energy. If we're going to be making bonds or intermolecular forces, we're actually going to be giving off energy. So again, just some examples that we've seen previously, but just to kind of review, sometimes we can have processes that are spontaneous that have a negative delta H. So for example, and I know it's a little counterintuitive, but when we take liquid water and we make it into ice, we freeze it, that's actually a 
favorable process from an enthalpy standpoint. The enthalpy for that is going to be negative. Now, a way to help remember that is if we wanted to take ice and make it into water, we would need to add heat. So going in the other direction means we're going to be removing heat. Remember too, we learned about uh, where we could add heat as a reagent looking at enthalpies. So if we've got a negative delta H, that means heat is gonna be a product that's here. So again, we're gonna be removing heat in order to take liquid water and make it into ice. And that's something we learned about before. Similarly, if we've got a combustion reaction, we're gonna be burning, for example, methane gas in our furnace, generating carbon dioxide in water. That's an exothermic reaction. We know that because that generates heat that we can use to heat our houses. Similarly, when we have metal oxidation or the formation of rust, that is going to be an exothermic process as well. But as we learned about before, we also can have spontaneous processes that have positive delta H's that are endothermic reactions, right? So again, this process of melting ice is going to be endothermic. That makes sense, right? We know that if we want to melt ice, we need to add heat. But some other things that we saw as examples, for example, in chapter 13, is when we have something like ammonium nitrate, that's what you'd find in a cold pack. When you break that cold pack and you release the water into that salt, you actually create a cold solution. And that's because it pulls in heat from the surroundings to allow this process to happen. So this dissolution or the dissolving of this salt and water is an endothermic process. It requires heat and so uh, it has a positive delta H. Okay, we also can have chemical reactions that are going to be endothermic. And again, we'd have heat would be added as a reagent here to allow this process to proceed. So things that we've seen before, but we're gonna expand on this in this chapter and we're gonna think about how this applies and integrates with entropy. So the second law of thermodynamics has more to do with entropy. First law has to do with enthalpy. Second law is entropy. So the second law states that a process occurs spontaneously in a direction that increases the entropy of the universe. And our first problem that we're going to go through here is actually going to do um, a calculation based on thinking about delta S of the universe. So looking at our ca uh, candle example here, we can, we can apply kind of concepts of entropy here as well. So again, the physical changes that are going on here where we're having a melting of our ice, that is a situation where entropy is increased. We've got very ordered solid ice becomes more disordered liquid water. So entropy is increased in that situation. Chemical changes here that are happening are also going to be increasing the entropy. Again, we've got fewer numbers of reactants when we have wax and oxygen creating more molecules such as carbon dioxide and water. So both of these processes are actually going to help increase the entropy. So one of the things that we're going to see here in this chapter is that when we think about enthalpy and entropy as explaining the spontaneity of chemical processes, enthalpy is an important contributor to spontaneity, but it alone cannot be a determinant, right? We just went through three examples of endothermic reactions, which were spontaneous. So clearly something else must be going on. And again, entropy is going to be an important contributor to spontaneity, but it alone cannot be a determinant. And what we're really going to start building on here is the concept that entropy and enthalpy are both important to spontaneity. So here's uh, an equation here that we're going to see for the first problem we're going to go through today. Only three problems to work through today. But this tells us that the entropy of the universe is always increasing. So delta S of universe is always going to be increasing. So the next time your mom tells you, hey, you need to clean up your room. It's really disorganized in here. You can just say, hey, mom, the entropy of the universe is increasing. I'm just helping with that. But the concept here is that we're going to have two contributions to the entropy of the universe. One is the entropy of our system. So what is our chemical or our physical process doing? And the next is, well, what is the environment surrounding our system doing? And the idea is, is that the entropy of the universe is really a contribution of both of these. 
Now, I, I know it sounds like we're kind of getting more physics-like with things here, but just stick with me for a minute and understand that this is going to be an important equation that we're going to use, as well as the understanding that delta s of the universe will always be positive. So what this equation sort of tells us here is if we want to think about um, delta s of the surroundings, delta s of the surroundings is going to be dependent on the enthalpy of our system divided by the temperature. Now again, this is an important sort of piece here to note that this is talking about surroundings, this is talking about system. So again, we have to make sure that we're keeping track of this is looking at whether heat is taken in or given off by our process, our chemical or our physical change, our system. And this has to do with how the entropy of the surrounding environment is changing. Now you don't need to understand too much beyond that but we need to make sure when we're putting pieces into this equation that we put the right pieces in. So this is actually the first problem that we're going to go through. Sample problem 20.3 basically is just asking us to calculate what delta S of the universe is and again state whether the reaction occurs spontaneously at this temperature. So this again we haven't really done too much with this so I'm going to move on to the solution here to sort of just walk through how to think about this problem. Okay, so they tell us that at 298K, the formation of ammonia has a negative delta S of system. So again, they tell us what the delta S of the system is. So this is the entropy of that system, and it's negative, so that means it's unfavorable. Okay, so again, they want us to calculate delta S of the universe. So I'm going to flip through and just kind of walk through this because it is something new. So remember, delta S of the universe, we said, is always going to be positive for a spontaneous process. And we know that delta S of the universe is contribution from delta S of the system, which they tell us, and delta S of the surroundings. And we know we can calculate delta S of the surroundings using this equation. Delta S of the surroundings equals negative delta H of the system divided by T. Okay, so one of the things that kind of brings this problem together is Maybe you remember from chapter six, if not, we're going to review it in a little bit. We can use appendix B to calculate delta H of the system. Do you remember that appendix B where we would look up delta H F values and you'd have to put what the values were for each of these specific components in your chemical reaction? And then it was products minus reactants, all of that. We'll review that in a little bit here and practice it again if you don't remember it fully. But that's how we're going to get this piece of information since it wasn't what was given. They give us the temperature of the system, okay? And so delta S of the surroundings being delta H of the system divided by the temperature is going to end up being 308 joules per Kelvin, okay? So that's how we're going to get this piece. They give us the delta S of the system. We're going to need to do a little bit of work to calculate delta S of the surroundings, but adding these two together is going to be what gives us delta S of the universe. So wrapping this problem up, adding in the delta H of the system, which was provided at negative 197 joules per Kelvin, adding that to the delta S of the surroundings, which is positive 308 um, joules per Kelvin, adding those two together gives us the delta S of the universe as positive 111 joules per Kelvin. So that's our final answer here. So if we want to answer the question, um, state whether or not it occurs spontaneously. Remember, for a spontaneous process, we want to have positive delta S values. So yes, this is a spontaneous process. Okay, so again, two parts to this problem. Recognizing that delta S of the universe is a combination of both of these pieces, one which is given directly to us, 
the other one we needed to calculate. Now this problem would have been easier if they just told us what delta H of the reaction was, but we had to rely on a skill we learned in Gen Chem 1 and Appendix B in order to calculate that value. If that's still a little bit fuzzy for you, we're going to do some more problems in just a minute that allow us to think about Appendix B again. So a little bit more on entropy, and we're going to do a qualitative problem on entropy and then a quantitative problem on entropy. So again, when you think about entropy, I want you to think about disorder. The letter is S, so enthalpy was H, and I want you to think of heat. Entropy is S, I want you to think about disorder. So for entropy, I want you to think of a bunch of M words. I want you to think about more molecules, moving more. If you have a process that makes more molecules or allows those molecules to move around more, that's a favorable process. So favorable processes make more molecules and increase movement. So have a few examples here to think about, some you know ones that we've already sort of talked about. We've got ice melting, we've got a salt being dissolved in water, and then we have a chemical reaction. So one of the things here that we talked about before was these enthalpy values. Well, we want to be able to think about and predict what might be happening with the entropy values for these. So again, if we think about um, you know, spontaneous processes, we can kind of look at what's happening with the chemical entities there, either atoms, molecules, or ions, and think about what's happening and whether that would be favorable from an entropic or an entropy standpoint. Remember, each of these processes, these are the same ones as the last uh, slide there, each of these processes had a positive enthalpy, which meant that was not favorable from an enthalpy standpoint. Okay, so that must mean that entropy is favorable for these processes. So let's see if we can rationalize why that's the case. Well, when we go from an ordered solid to a more disordered liquid, going through that phase change, we are giving those molecules more freedom of motion, more molecules moving more. So the moving more place uh, our situation kind of comes into place here. So that's why we can explain why this is a favorable process. Thinking about this salt dissolving, right? If we take these ions that are in a very ordered crystal lattice and we kind of move them around here, we give them more freedom of motion, more molecules moving more. So this is again a moving more situation to explain the favorable entropy here. And then for our chemical reaction here, we can see that we've got more molecules that we've created. So again, giving more molecules, more freedom of motion is going to be favorable from an entropy standpoint. So kind of that little exercise was important because our next problem here it's going to ask us to think about that qualitatively. So one other little piece here I want to just highlight before we go on to practice that problem is a reminder that entropy is temperature dependent. And this should make sense. If we're talking about more molecules moving more, well, how do we get molecules to move around more? Well, we heat them up. We increase the temperature of the surroundings. And so this picture might look a little bit weird, but I want you to imagine that this was a molecule that we were tracing its motion. Okay, so the little black line represents how much that molecule is moving about. Okay, and remember when we pretended like we were molecules, imagine if we were in a low temperature state, you wouldn't move around very much, and you'd kind of stay in that general area. If we added heat, we increase the temperature of the surroundings, you'd have more energy and you'd move around more. So that's just kind of a, a simulated demonstration of the temperature effect on entropy. So again, this is an important concept to think about, that if we increase the temperature, we're going to increase the motion, and so we're going to increase entropy. So again, entropy is temperature dependent. We're going to see that when we go through an example here, um, thinking about how heating up a system can increase the entropy. So hopefully a plot like this kind of looks a little bit familiar. Remember when we did our heating and cooling curves, okay, where we had um, an increase here that allowed us to explain kind of increases in temperature and then increases um, in heat that was added or enthalpy in that system.
All right, so I'm gonna set this problem up for you here and I'd like you to pause it and, and uh, take a stab at trying to predict this. For each of these, you're just going to be uh, picking which one of the uh, situations here is going to have higher entropy. Okay. They're all going to be under constant temperature except for E, which again, we can see that the temperature has changed. But I want you to think about the concept of more molecules moving more, more molecules moving more. And use that to try to predict which of the two situations is going to have the higher entropy in these situations. So go ahead, take a guess, see if you can figure this out, pause the video, and when you're ready to check your answers, press play again. Okay, so I'm going to walk through each one of these. I'll go fairly quickly so again we can move on to our last problem here. So when we think about entropy, think about more molecules moving more. Think about creating disorder in your system. So for problems like you'll have like this, you want to just ask the question, what's different between the two situations that I might be able to apply my more molecules moving more? Well, when we have one mole of SO2 gas or one mole of SO3 gas, if we've got a larger molecule, there's more atoms, there's going to be more molecular motion, greater entropy in one mole of SO3 than one mole of SO2. One mole of, S of CO2 solid versus one mole of CO2 gas. Again, gases are always going to have greater entropy than liquids and then clearly greater entropy than solids. 3 moles of O2 or 2 moles of O3. Now this one's a little bit like apples and oranges where we have larger molecules but fewer of them. Well in this case the uh, number of molecules is always going to have a greater contribution to entropy than a greater size molecule. So in this case the 3 moles of O2 is going to have greater entropy than the 2 moles of O3. So we've got one mole of solid KBr or one mole of KBr that we've dissolved and made an aqueous solution. Again, we've got greater disorder in an aqueous solution, so greater entropy is with one mole of aqueous KBr. We've got seawater at 2 degrees or warmed up to 23 degrees. Remember, anytime we increase temperature, we increase entropy. So the seawater at 23 degrees is going to have a greater entropy. One mole of CF4 or one mole of CCl4. Again, both of these are gases. We have the same amount. The only thing that's different is the CCl bond is going to be a larger, longer bond than we see in CF4. So that bigger bond is going to allow for more molecular movement. And so we're going to see greater entropy in this bigger molecule. Okay, a few homework problems will allow you to practice that more. These are the kinds of questions you're likely to see in sort of the part one of our exam. All right, the last little piece from this lecture, uh, this first lecture that we have on thermodynamics is applying a concept that you guys have already done already. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because hopefully it's a review. Do you remember when we were uh, thinking about Hess's law and delta H of formation? If you had some reactants that were making their way into products and you wanted to figure out what delta H of the reaction was, you could imagine decomposing all of your reactants and then forming all of your products and you could use this equation. Remember this one from uh, chapter 6 in Gen Chem 1? That's where we had to use Appendix B. And I've provided uh, Appendix B for you on Blackboard, so you can uh, access it there. But you essentially just had to look up all of your different species on Appendix B and then put them into this equation, taking into account proper coefficients that we'd have here. And it's always products minus reactants to give you the delta H of the overall reaction. So this was sort of a hypothetical thing. It's not what happens in reality, but it allows us to use um, theoretical data to get to an interesting you know, uh, component or a part of a reaction. Okay, so again, we uh, applied this in chapter six for enthalpy. It was one of the ways that we learned how to calculate enthalpy in Gen Chem 1. You had to look up each of your species on Appendix B. You had to make sure to take into account how many moles of each you had. You summed up all those energies for your products, and you subtracted all the energies for your reactants to get the net delta H for your reaction. 
all we're going to be doing is doing the same thing for enthalpy. And so we're going to have an equation or a, uh, an equation here, a chemical reaction that we'll look at it for. But I'm going to flip here. I've got Appendix B for you. So hopefully you'll see it here and you're like, oh yeah, I remember Appendix B. When we did stuff last year, all we did was look at this column. Remember, you had to find the right sort of phase that you maybe had for something, and then you literally just grabbed the number off the table. So all we're doing is that same kind of a problem, but we're just using a different column of data. We're going to use the entropy data now. Okay, so I've actually provided it here for you. We've got the three pages that we have for Appendix B. So I want you guys to try doing that for this problem. Hopefully you remember how to do it. Again, just a little heads up. Um, how I liked to solve these problems when we did them in Gen Chem 1 is write the value from Appendix B for each of these species underneath its corresponding species on our chemical equation. Make sure to multiply ones that have coefficients and then take products, sum up all of these values, and subtract the sum of all your reactants. So go ahead and try that right now. Again, see if you're able to get to the correct answer. Let me tell you what the correct answer is here so you can check your work. The correct answer should be minus 374 joules per Kelvin. So pause the video, go ahead and try that, and then when you're ready, press play to work uh, to see the uh, work through solution. All right, moving on to the worked out solution here. This also asks us to predict the sign of delta S of reaction if possible. So let's kind of go through that piece first. So we want to just sort of predict what we think. Here's how you might predict what's going on with the reaction. The first thing you want to do, remember, we always talk about more molecules moving more. And this is really only relevant for gases. So the first thing you want to do if you want to predict entropy, count the number of gas molecules on each side. If we are making more molecules, we would predict that entropy is favorable. It's going to be positive. It will be increasing. In this case, we actually make fewer molecules. So entropy should be decreasing, and that's unfavorable. Okay. So again, here's what we need to have here. You write down your balanced chemical equation. Go ahead and look up those values that we have for these species on Appendix B. So if you need to, go ahead and pause and make sure you can find each one of these species on Appendix B. You have to make sure you grab, this was a common mistake uh, for uh, students in Gen Chem 1, make sure you're looking at the phases of the substances so you grab the right value here. Okay, then we need to take products minus reactants. So notice what I did here. I've got three moles of CO2, so it's three times 213. I'm adding that to four times 69.9. Okay, so these essentially are my gains. So I'm gonna have these guys here. And then I have to subtract off my losses. So it's 269.9 times one, and then 205 times five. So that's where I get that piece. Again, probably it's worth kind of summing all of that up together, summing all of this up together, and then taking the difference, which again is going to be minus 374 joules per Kelvin. All right, so that's it for this first lecture here. Again, just a little bit uh, to summarize here, we reviewed a lot of concepts. We talked about how fast a reaction occurs. That's kinetics. That's activation energy. We talked about whether a reaction occurs and how much product is made. We talked about that thermodynamically from an enthalpy standpoint. And again, we learned about how, uh, how much product we make when we talked about equilibrium. So then we introduced and reviewed the first law of thermodynamics, which is enthalpy. So thinking about heat, um, envisioning bonds and intermolecular forces, thinking and remembering that favorable processes will release heat and make bonds and intermolecular forces. And then the second law of thermodynamics relates to entropy. So again, think about disorder. Envision more molecules moving more. So things that are favorable make more molecules or increase movement. And the last piece was reminding us that entropy is temperature dependent. And so the physical state and things that undergo phase changes are going to contribute significantly to entropy.
So truly there wasn't too much that was new in what we did here. We learned about kind of applying those concepts of spontaneity to, um, uh, to entropy here, thinking about energy that's being released or gained, but again, introducing that new concept of spontaneity, understanding that it has contributions from both enthalpy and entropy. And actually, we did two, uh, three sample problems here. We both predicted changes in entropy. We talked about the entropy of the universe as our first problem. And then our last problem here, we actually calculated changes in entropy using Appendix B.